on World News Tonight. A sudden visit. Zelensky visits the front line and is on his way to make a visit to Washington. NHS walkout. UK nurses track for the second day as the government refuses to give way on pay. Peace conference. In a time of increased instability, Jordan hosts Midi Summit in a bid to defuse regional tensions. And festive lights. Madrid sparkles in illuminating lights ahead of Christmas. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you're joining us on World News. Now, tonight's top story is on the surprise visit announced by the Ukrainian president. Volodymyr Zelensky is on his way to visit the U.S. on his first trip abroad since the war broke out 10 months ago. So far, no U.S. official are confirming the reports possibly because this could put the Ukrainian president in danger on his journey. During the visit, he would be meeting President Joe Biden and possibly also addressing the U.S. capital. This comes as he visited the frontline city that Russia has long tried and failed to capture. In a show of defiance, the Ukrainian president has visited troops fighting in the frontline Donbass city of Bakhmut. Vladimir Zelensky presented medals to soldiers battling to drive Russian forces back from the besieged eastern settlement. While the army may be holding their ground, it's a different story for the dwindling population there, with many being forced to evacuate. Far away from the front line, the Russian president has also been handing out honors. In an address marking Security Agency's day, Vladimir Putin acknowledged extreme difficulties afflicting Kremlin officials. I would especially like to mention the divisions of the security agencies that have begun to operate in new regions of Russia. Yes, it is difficult for you now, the situation in the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic, in the Kherson and Zaporizhia regions, is extremely difficult. Among those receiving medals were the Moscow-installed leaders of the four Ukrainian regions occupied and annexed by Russia. As the war grinds on, none of these territories are actually fully under Moscow's control. Thousands of nurses walked off the job in their second 24-hour strike this month in the UK. Ambulance drivers, paradigmics and dispatchers are set to strike today and again on the 28th of December. The government says it will dispatch 1,200 troops to fill in for striking ambulance drivers and border staff who are due to walk out later this week. Unions say ambulance crews will attend the most serious calls, but officials say that they can't guarantee everyone who needs an ambulance will get one. From Liverpool to Cardiff to London, up to 100,000 nurses across Britain have left their wards for the second time in a week and been a standoff with the government over pay and conditions. Pay also has to be part of that negotiation process and if he's not prepared to talk about pay, then the strikes will continue. The pandemic put an additional strain on the country's already overstretched National Health Service. Then came the cost of living crisis with inflation soaring above 10 per cent, pushing healthcare workers to breaking point. After voting to stage industrial action for the first time in their 106-year history, the country's largest nursing union warned they won't back down, saying the government's offer of a 4 per cent pay rise is not enough. We want to be in caring for our patients, we want to be looking after our patients, but we need to have pay addressed. We need to have the 50,000 vacancies in this country addressed. And the pri this is on the Prime Minister's shoulders, not the nursing staff. The government insists it cannot afford a double-digit salary raise in the public sector and that such a move would lead to prices surging even further. I know things are difficult at the moment for people up and down the country with inflation. Of course I get that, but I think it's, I think it's entirely right for me to stand here and say that we have treated everyone reasonably and fairly and will continue to do that. Authorities are warning people not to undertake any risky activity, as more than 10,000 ambulance drivers, paramedics and call handlers are set to join the strike on Wednesday. In response, the government has turned to the military for a backup putting 600 drivers and 150 logistical staff on standby.
Jordan hosts a Middle East summit bringing together regional and international players hoping to help resolve regional crises, particularly in neighboring Iraq. The Baghdad II meeting, which will also include officials from France and the European Union, follows an August 2021 summit in Iraq's capital organized at the initiative of French President Emmanuel Macron. It's a peace conference at a time of increasing instability. Initiated by France and Iraq a year ago, the second edition of the conference taking place in Jordan aims to restore stability to Iraq and also to the region. That is too ambitious, say some observers, given recent events in the Middle East. For three months, protests have swept across Iran, violently suppressed by the regime. Syria continues to be the site of proxy clashes between foreign powers, while Iraq has just named a pro-Iranian politician prime minister after a year of political crisis. For Tehran, it's a chance to put its nuclear program back on the table, which has been suspended for the past four years. Urdun forsat monasib is ke ma betavanim in goftegoharo takmil bokonim. Omidvar hastam ke ba tavajjoh be رویکرد آمریکایی ها در سه ماه گذشته شاهد تغییر رویکرد و واقع بینان رفتار کردن طرف آمریکایی باشه. One of the main observers is the European Union foreign policy chief Joseph Borre who will coordinate the talks. The aim is to guarantee Iran's nuclear policy will continue to be for civilian use only, but that will require the agreement of Saudi Arabia, Iran's main regional rival. And with a host of games of influence at play throughout the region, getting any agreement at this conference is likely to be a tall task. In the U.S., a magnitude of 6.4 earthquake that struck off the coast of Northern California has damaged homes, roads and water systems and left tens of thousands of people without electricity. At least 11 people were reported injured and two others died from medical emergencies that occurred during or just after the quake. California resident Darren Gallagher woke up to this, damage to his Rio Del home after a strong 6.4 magnitude earthquake struck off the coast of Northern California, followed by more than three dozen aftershocks. Houses, a bridge and several roads were damaged, with one road reportedly sinking due to the quake. Thousands of homes and businesses were left without power on Tuesday, and officials said there were gas leaks in the region. For Gallagher, his porch got the worst of it. Sleeping on the couch and I heard big bang and stuff started falling, so I opened the door and this is what I opened it up to, right here. Whole front porch fell off. There's a dirt bike over there holding up that end. Jackie McIntosh said she and her husband had put their Rio Del house up for sale and they were expecting an offer. That was before the quake. I don't think this house is going to be able to be brought back. There was an earthquake in, I think it was 92, that this happened to the house last time. Um, and I just, I don't know if it's gonna come back from this one. Calls for help came in fast after the quake struck around 2.30 in the morning on Tuesday. The quake, which was felt miles away in San Francisco, definitely packed some punch. He added that there was significant damage to Rio Del's water system and that some residents on Tuesday were left without it. The Biden administration said that it would no longer wind down the so-called Title 42 policy even if the Supreme Court allowed it to follow through on a lower court's ruling to effectively terminate the border directive that has prevented the entry of millions of migrants. The response from the Department of Justice comes a day after Chief Justice John Roberts issued a temporary stay of federal district court judge's order that required the Biden administration to lift the implementation of Title 42. Tonight, chaotic scenes in El Paso, including these migrants climbing over a border fence, others going under barbed wire put up by Texas National Guard, all part of an ongoing surge of illegal border crossings here and coming just as the Biden administration is asking the Supreme Court to lift a pandemic border restriction known as Title 42, a move border officials say would send the number of illegal border crossings soaring even higher to a record 10,000 per day. The Supreme Court has temporarily blocked lifting Title 42 at the request of 19 Republican states. 
But the Biden administration asking the court to reverse that in a filing tonight saying Title 42 is no longer necessary to protect public health. Meanwhile, in El Paso, officials say they're facing a humanitarian crisis. El Paso is in its fourth day of a state of emergency. Officials saying city resources are maxed out and they're pleading for federal help. We have seen a significant increase. In Ruben Garcia runs a network of 15 migrant shelters in El Paso and said he has had to turn migrants away because they don't have room. We're going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, following North Korea's missile launches over the weekend, South Korea and the United States held a combined aerial exercise involving the B-52 bomber and F-22 stealth fighters. This is the first time in more than four years that the U.S. has sent the Raptors to the nation. The U.S. has sent a B-52 bomber and F-22 stealth fighters to South Korea. They took part in a combined aerial exercise with South Korea on Tuesday at Korea's Air Defense Identification Zone near Jeju Island. B-52 bombers are capable of flying at high subsonic speeds and can carry nuclear or precision-guided conventional weapons. And this is the first time since May 2018 that the F-22 fifth-generation stealth fighters that are currently based in Okinawa, Japan, have come to South Korea to stage combined exercises. As for South Korea's Air Force, Seoul's Defense Ministry said F-35 stealth jets and F-15K fighters have joined the drill. The F-22s will be deployed in South Korea throughout this week to hold separate drills aimed at countering North Korea's nuclear and missile threats with Korea's F-35A. Seoul's defense ministry explained that the joint drill was to increase the sharing of information between the two allies and strengthen their capabilities when conducting combined military operations. It added that the deployment of B-52 and F-22 fighters is part of efforts to strengthen extended deterrence, as agreed upon last month during talks between the allies' top military officials in Washington. It also said South Korea and the U.S. will continue to strengthen their combined defense readiness against North Korea's threats. A committee in the United States House of Representatives has voted to publicly release years of tax returns obtained from former President Donald Trump, capping a years-long legal and political battle that started when he was in the White House. The full level of detail that will be revealed is uncertain, but lawmakers said that they expect to release six years of tax returns for Trump and eight affiliated companies. Some sensitive personal information would be redacted. While the 29-page report summarizing the committee's work was issued later, the tax returns themselves may not be released for several more days. The report indicates that the Trump administration may have disregarded an IRS requirement dating back to 1977 that mandates audits of a president's tax filings. The IRS only began to audit his 2015 tax filings on April 3, 2019, a date more than two years into Trump's presidency. The date also coincides with committee chairman Richard Neal making an initial request to the IRS for the former president's return information and related tax returns. It wasn't until September 2019 that the IRS began to audit Trump's 2016 tax filings. Audits were on a lag for his 2017, 2018 and 2019 filings and never even began to his 2020 submission. A separate report released by the Joint Committee on Taxation detailing Trump's report's income and tax owed suggested he paid a relatively modest share of his income to the federal government. An Italian court ruled that the wife of former MEP Pierre Antonio Penzira can be extradited to Belgium for charges in the alleged Qatar corruption scandal that has rocked the European Parliament. Maria Dolores Colioni was arrested in Italy earlier this month, accused of corruption, money laundering and criminal association. Her husband's think tank, Fight Impunity, is amongst the group that the centre of the so-called Qatar Gate scandal accused of intervening politically with members were working at the European Parliament for the benefit of Qatar and Morocco. It's confession time in the European Parliament corruption scandal. Ava Kiley, the former vice president of the institution, is said to have admitted asking her father to hide money. He was intercepted by the police nearly two weeks ago now with a suitcase full of cash as he left his hotel in the European district. According to Belgian newspaper Le Soir, Kylie confessed that bags of cash had indeed passed through her flat via her partner, Francesco Giorgi, and former Italian MEP Pierre Antonio Panzeri. 
According to the latest information, the former Italian parliamentarian is the leading figure of the alleged criminal organization, accused of corruption and money laundering. He also admitted his responsibility during a hearing, but accused another MEP of having received gifts. Italian judges authorized the extradition of Panzeri's wife on Tuesday, through whom the gifts were allegedly channeled. Panzeri founded the NGO Fight Impunity in 2019, which he allegedly used to set up his criminal network said to be for the benefit of Qatar and Morocco. On paper, the association appeared respectable. Its board of directors included two former European commissioners, a former French prime minister and the former head of European diplomacy, none of whom are under suspicion. The 20 or so searches carried out resulted in the seizure of 1.5 million euros in cash from the homes of the accused and their relatives. Greek MEP Kylie will appear before the Belgian courts on Thursday. Global markets were jolted overnight after the Bank of Japan unexpectedly widened its target range for 10-year Japanese government bond yields, sparkling a self-off in bonds and stocks around the world. The central bank caught markets off guard by tweaking its yield curve control policy to allow the yield on the 10-year Japanese government bond to move 50 basis points either side of its 0% target up from 25 basis points previously in a move aimed at cushioning if effects of protracted monetary stimulus measures. The Bank of Japan shocked markets on Tuesday. It made a surprise tweet to its bond yield control that allows long-term interest rates to rise more. It allowed the 10-year bond yield to move 50 basis points either side of its 0% target, wider than the previous 25 basis point band. Investors had expected the BOJ to make no changes to its yield curve control, at least until Haruhika Kuroda stepped down as governor in April. Kuroda denied the move was an interest rate hike. The central bank kept its yield target unchanged and said it would sharply raise bond buying, a sign the move was a fine-tuning of its current ultra-loose monetary policy rather than a withdrawal of stimulus. Kuroda said the move was aimed at ironing out distortions in the shape of the yield curve. He also wants to make sure the benefits of the bank's stimulus program are directed to markets and companies. Investors were caught so off guard that shares tanked while the yen and bond yields spiked. The share average on Japan's benchmark Nikkei dropped 2.5% after the decision. The dollar also fell to a four-month low against the yen. A German court convicted a 97-year-old woman of being an accessory to murder of her role as a secretary, the SS commander of the Nazi start of concentration camp during World War II. Imgard Furchner was accused of being part of the apparatus that helped the camp function. The Itzehoe uh, State Court in northern Germany gave her a two-year suspended sentence. They call her the Secretary of Evil. Today, 97-year-old Imgard F. was found guilty of aiding the murders of more than 10,000 people. All prisoners here at Stutthof concentration camp, where she worked for the Nazi SS commander for two years. Detainees at Nazi extermination camps were gassed, shot, starved and often worked to death. At least 65,000 of those forced through the so-called death gate at Stutthof didn't survive. In the archive were shown orders believed to have been countersigned by Imgard F. during her time as a secretary. She's never admitted any guilt for the horrors committed here. There's four years difference between us. Manfred was a child prisoner in Stutthof at this time. He thinks his baby brother was among those killed. The 97-year-old initially tried to avoid justice, fleeing from the authorities. Old age means this could be the last in a string of Nazi trials as Germany tries to confront its past. A two-year suspended sentence for her role in the crimes committed here means Irmgard F. will not die in jail. But today's verdict proves that justice has no time limit and age is no defence. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. 
Widespread flooding swept across two states along the east coast of Peninsular Malaysia after days of continuous heavy rainfall. Elon Musk has said that he will resign as Twitter's chief executive officer when he finds someone, quote, foolish enough to take the job. The billionaire promised to earlier to abide by the result of a Twitter poll which saw 57.5% of users vote yes to him to quitting the role. FTX founder Sam Bankman fried has signed legal papers paving the way for his extradition for the Bahamas in the US, where he faces fraud charges over the cryptocurrency exchange's collapse. The Taliban have banned women from universities in Afghanistan, sparking international condemnation and despair amongst young people in the country. The Higher Education Minister announced the regression, saying it would take immediate effect. Just over 11% of eligible voters cast ballots in Tunisia's election, the first election since President Kai Saeed orchestrated a sweeping power grab in 2021. Critics pointed to the low turnout as another step away from democracy in the country. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. And we are leaving you tonight with Spain's capital, Madrid, shining bright during the Christmas season as the city's main landmarks flaunt festive lights, attracting thousands onto the streets. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and have a good night.